Okay, it is time to start. So hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay Ringette, and I'm the Director of Marketing at ISA Cybersecurity. Thank you for joining us today for our panel discussion titled Instant Response 360, What to Expect Before, During, and After a Cybersecurity Breach. Before we begin the discussion, I'll share a few quick housekeeping notes. First, this event is being recorded and the recording will be made available after. Second, there will be time for a Q&A at the end. Please put your questions in the Q&A feature and note which panelist the question is for. We'll do our best to get, everyone, get to everyone's questions, but if we run out of time, we'll send a follow-up email with the answers to questions we didn't get to. Third, as you can see, there's a chat function. We encourage you to interact with other guests, but please ensure you put your questions for the panelists in the Q&A. I now have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, Danny Pehar. Danny has more than 20 years of experience in the cybersecurity industry and has become one of its foremost experts. He's a member of the Forbes Technology Council, a monthly contributor to Forbes magazine, and he has regular television appearances. You might have seen him on Global TV's The Morning Show, where he's appeared several times. As the architect of the cybercrime equation, Danny works closely with the Toronto Police Cyber Task Force, as well as the FBI Cyber Task Force. He also sits on the board of directors of InfoSec TO. Over to you, Danny. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Lindsay. And thank you to all the people that are attending our session today. Uh, you know what? We know you guys are all really busy, so we really appreciate you giving us some time to have some dive in and have some great conversations about this sort of stuff. Thank you, of course, also to ISA as our gracious hosts putting this whole thing together. And thank you to our panelists, which I'm going to be introducing in just a couple minutes. But before we do that, Lindsay, can you pull up the poll question that we have uh, for our attendees? So our poll question, if you were hit with ransomware, would you pay the ransom demand? Certainly a very important question in this day and age. Your options are yes, no, or maybe, because that depends. So please, guys, take some time and, and, and give some thoughts on this. And while you're giving some thoughts on this, I'm actually going to give sort of a quick state of the union what's happening in the world of security. So I've been in the security world for the past 20 years. And what's interesting is, is when I first got into this, I remember people were complaining to me saying, Danny, we need your help with viruses. We need your help with cyber criminals. Well, we fast forward 20 years later, what are people asking for my help on? Danny, we need your help with viruses. We need your help with cyber criminals. The same problems, but plus a boatload more. And it's interesting because every year that I've been doing this, Someone would say there would be an article or a stat or a research that would come out that would say, this is the year, it's never been this bad. And I remember reading in 2019, reading an article, one that sounded very familiar to me saying 2019 was the worst year on record, terrible stats, terrible whatever. And then 2020 comes around and 2020 is like, hey guys, hold my beer. Of course, everything went crazy in 2020 with the pandemic and, and cyber crime was no different. But just recently, you take a look at what happened with that pipeline attack in the states. There are several states now that have declared a state of emergency because they can't get gas because of this cyber attack. You guys remember that movie from the 70s, Mad Max? That's what those guys were fighting over. They were fighting over people couldn't get gas. And this is what we're living in now. And so much of it is coming from cybercrime. Now, it's interesting. Why is it that it seems like so many other technologies, they get better with time? Technology industries do seem to get better with time, but the problems associated with what we're talking about, they seem to get worse over time. And, and it's primarily because the problems associated with what we're talking about, they're not technology problems. They are people problems. If you look at cybercrime itself, cybercrime is, yeah, sometimes those conversations certainly get very technical, but really what we are talking about is we are talking about people committing crime. As long as those people keep making money doing what they're doing, that problem is going to exist. You add in other factors that have changed over the last 20 years, like the government's involvement. And you, you start to think, whoa, how I respond to this could actually be worse than the crime itself. You take a look at what happened at Uber in 2016. Uber was breached. As a result, the bad guys took them for $100,000. 
but they did everything wrong with regards to that response. And as a result, they were fined by their government. What was that fine? Keeping in mind, the bad guys stole 100K. They were fined $148 million. Whoa. So now it's not just about protection, but it's about everything else and how we react to those problems, which makes sense when you look at the NIST cybersecurity framework. It does not just stop at protection. It goes on to talk about detection, response, recovery, and of course, identifying all the pieces that you need in order to do that properly. And that's what today's panel session is all about. And that's what I'm really excited for. So before we introduce our awesome panelists, Lindsay, if we can call up um, what were the results of that poll, I'd love to take a look at that. Okay, you know what? I love this. So we have a smaller percentage saying yes, a, a, a slightly larger percentage saying no, and the majority saying maybe. And for me, that's really what I was looking for. It's really what I was hoping for is that maybe. One of the reasons is it's kind of like if you ask someone, hey, would you jump out of a plane for a million dollars? And some people were quick to say yes or no, but really we don't know all the factors. Is the plane on the ground? Is the plane over an active volcano? Once we know all the factors, it helps us make that decision. Now, I'll give you an example. For me, I never like telling people what to do with regards to a ransomware, whether it's pay or not pay. I respect your decision, whatever that decision is. However, I want to make sure you understand your decision. And that's really what I push for, right? Let's take a look at what happened to Atlanta, Georgia a couple years back. Atlanta, Georgia, they were hit with ransomware. The perpetrators were asking for $50,000. And Atlanta, Georgia said, we're going to do an assessment to see what will this cost us to not pay. And their assessment was, if we don't pay, it's going to cost us $2 million to work around. And they said, we're not going to pay. We would rather do the cost of $2 million because we don't negotiate with terrorists. And I was like, you know what? I don't know if I would do that being in their shoes, but I do respect their decision. But where it got wrong, though, was shortly after that, they realized, uh-oh, we made a mistake. It's not $2 million. It's actually going to cost us $3 million. And shortly after that, they're like, oh, you know what? It's not three million. It's six million. And then it was it's not six. It's nine. And then it was it's not nine. It's 12. And then it's not 12. It's 13 million. I stopped following the story. I was too stressed at that point. And that for me is what I don't like when somebody makes a decision, but they're not doing it based on all the factors for a lot of organizations. If it's a difference between 50,000 and 13 million, you're going out of business. And that's not really a choice to, to make. And so for me and for all of us here, what we're really promoting today is education and understanding and make sure you know what you're getting into. And that's what this is all about. So let's get right into who we have for our panelists. But I'm really excited about our first panelist that, that, that I'm going to call upon is a while back when you suffered a breach, you might call somebody from the likes of me. You might call someone within the cybersecurity industry. But now when you suffer a breach, your first call you probably want to call somebody like this next person. So Eric, if I can call on you and if I can ask you, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us what you're all about. Thanks, Danny. Uh, well, my name's Eric Charleston. I'm a partner in Miller Thompson's Insurance and Privacy Group. And what I do in these circumstances is I do two things. First, I work for organizations that suffer uh, cyber breaches or security incidents that have a privacy component. And my role there is to be immediate incident response boots on the ground. And what that means is I come in because I'm a lawyer and I'm helping to coordinate the response. I attach legal privilege to all of the activity that happens in the wake of the incident. But even more important than that is I'm the cool hand that coordinates the response. I retain the forensics to make sure that the privilege attaches there. I retain any PR consultant or communications consultant that helps respond to the incident. And very importantly, I evaluate the regulatory impact and the potential business impact of the privacy breach. I figure out, do we have to tell government regulators or individuals about this? What are the legal requirements? But really more important than that, Danny, what I do is I lay out the pluses and minuses for the organization in how they can tactically respond. And it's really helpful because when this kind of thing happens, everybody who's in charge, their hair is on fire. This is not what they normally do. And what yes. I'm able to do is come in and be the cool hand to help coordinate the response and protect the response from any outside prying eyes 
until the organization is ready to face the public or face the government or face their clients and consumers and tell them what happened. That's what a breach coach does. The other thing that I do is I'm a cyber insurance coverage lawyer. So I also work for cyber insurers, helping them to respond to incidents when they get claims on their cyber policies. I help the insurers understand what's in, what's out on the policies, and I also help the insureds, the businesses that are making claims on their policies, I help them understand what the insurer's response is. I do insurance speak, I translate for them, and I help them understand what's in and what's out of their cyber coverage. That's awesome, Eric. Thank you so much for joining us today. I will say, whenever I've worked with a breach coach lawyer, one of the things that I love about what they bring to the table is they act as a project manager and they pull in so many of the other, of the other resources to get past that breach. And, you know, you, you would not take on a complicated project without a project manager. And I promise you, nothing's going to be more complicated than responding to a breach. So you definitely want to have somebody like that in your kit. Now, speaking of your toolkit, uh, what I'm really happy about our next panelist is for years, People like myself have been telling people, telling organizations, hey, listen, man, cybercrime is really serious. And when you get hit, if you get hit, your, your brand is going to be the one that's going to be damaged the most. You really have to be careful. You have to watch that brand. And so it really makes sense. If we are talking to people about protecting their brand, then it really makes sense. We got to have a PR expert on hand when we have that conversation. So introducing Katie. Katie, please, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're all about? Thanks, Danny. Um, so Katie Clark, I lead um, our U. I I work for a company called Edelman, which is the largest communications PR firm in the world. We have operations in Canada, in five cities in Canada. I'm actually uh, a member of our U.S. team at Edelman, although I'm Canadian. So I'm, I'm originally, I'm a Nova Scotian. I'm originally from the East Coast, but I now live in Atlanta, which you made a shout out to, Danny, and I'm going to come back to that point in a second. Um, I now live in Atlanta and I run our U.S. data privacy and security group within our um, crisis and reputation risk practice. So as Danny said, you know, reputation is one of the biggest assets a company has. Um, and these kinds of incidents um, are very destabilizing, both from a business standpoint, also a relationship standpoint, and to your reputation. So the the role where Eric was talking about, um, you know, legal being the and the breach coach brings everyone together. You know, we work hand in hand with legal and forensics to make sure that as we're communicating through the process, or even if we're preparing you in advance of that, that we're making sure you don't get ahead of your skis and saying something that you know, we can't prove or that isn't true or that's going to um, come out and, you know, change a little bit later. So our role is really helping companies communicate on, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but even in the first 24, 72 hours, the things that are being communicated internally with your teams, with the employees, even before maybe you're communicating with clients, those things can all, um, you know, set up the narrative going forward. And so thinking about what that looks like, and having someone um, support you through that process and, and apply best practices is something that we do on a regular basis. I will say in terms of my um, area of expertise, I've been working in this, um, I've been working in crisis for more than 25 years and really in data security and privacy for more than 15 now. But I actually was, um, Edelman was the partner and I was on the, um, the response team for the city of Atlanta a few years ago when that incident happened. So I actually have, I have, I have, some, I have some additional Thoughts on what Danny was providing, but um, you know, I think the, the challenge is in all of these instances, as we're going to talk about, you don't, you have imperfect information. You will not have the answers. There's a lot of armchair quarterbacking that goes in later to judging how companies make decisions. The reality is you won't have half of what you want to be able to make decisions. And you're going to be communicating and taking decisions in that environment and emotion clouds judgment. And so a big part of you know, what you get with teams like the folks here and other companies that do this work is the perspective of experience and best practice in helping guide those decisions. Yeah, awesome. Um, you know, it's it's such an important call to have to be able to speak to somebody like Katie, like Eric, when you're in these situations and helping you respond, uh, which which will lead to a good response, will lead to a recovery in uh, in the event, in the horrible event of a cyber breach to your organization. Now, the next panelist, 
The next panelist ties it back to core cybersecurity. And of course, he's the president and CEO of our host organization. So Kevin, uh, he's our next panelist. Kevin from ISA, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're all about? Thanks, Danny. Uh, my name is Kevin Dawson, president of ISA and, and CEO. I run an organization of about 105 cybersecurity experts across Canada. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to be hosting this panel today with, with this group of people. At its core, uh, what ISA does is really supports and provides information uh, to, to people like Eric uh, to help make those decisions. We also obviously supply that information to the clients um, to help make their decisions. And, and we try to do it in, in as empathetic and as, uh, I guess, cool and calm as collected as possible, um, bringing in, in, in a lot of cases, a, a non-biased uh, opinion to the situation because oftentimes for our clients uh, and, and for, for our, our customers that get uh, uh, victimized in an attack, this is their darkest hour. I mean, as you alluded to, Danny, I mean, $13 million puts some companies out of business. So um, really having that cool head and, and, and providing that information back to Eric and back to the client so that they can make uh, the best possible decisions. As Katie said, uh, not all the information is, is always 100% available, um, but through our, our forensics, through our, our incident response team, and then through the post remediation team, um, that's our goal is to provide information and, and also to provide information to, to the carriers and, and the ones that are uh, potentially uh, taking on this burden and in support of the client. Yeah, fantastic. Kevin, always a pleasure. Really happy uh, that you're here and really happy that you started putting this whole thing together for us. Now, for our final panelist, what I really like about Greg is Greg represents cyber insurance. What I love about cyber insurance is I fell in love with it back in 2014. There's an organization that I was working with. They suffered a breach. The perpetrators took them for $2 million. I'd never heard of cyber insurance, but it turns out they had it. What is it? Well, it's like regular insurance, except it's meant to protect against this sort of stuff. That company got their money back, and they're still here today because of that. Greg, why don't you let us know a little bit about yourself and what you're all about? Sure. Thanks, Danny, and thanks for having me, everyone. Um, you know, a lot like this panel, I'm the guy that clients don't want to have to hear from um, <laughs> at the end of the day, because if, you, if you're hearing from me, it means you're probably going through a type of loss. But what we do at Ridge Canada is we actually underwrite cyber risk for Canadian organizations. And then I get the great pleasure of working with uh, in these times of crisis for, for clients working with uh, you know my esteemed panelists through uh, to help clients get through and get back up and running uh, in the event that they, they fall victim to a, a cyber crime. Awesome. Fantastic, Greg. Always a pleasure doing these things with you. And thank you to all of our panelists. So let's get right into some questions. So the first question that I have for you guys, I'm actually going to ask all of you guys uh, for an answer. So I'll, so I'll call it out so we see it all together. And then what I'll do is I'll call on you one at a time. So the first question, very important one, what do companies need to do to prepare for and prevent a cyber attack? Eric, let's start with you. What are your thoughts on that? Danny, the first thing that I think companies need to do is they need to understand how a cyber attack takes place. And, and the best way to do that is to, to prepare what's called an incident response plan. Because as you start to think about how your operations can be limited, you realize who you'll need to communicate with and bring into the decision process when an incident like this happens. An incident response plan, it should be a concise document that explains who your decision makers are when this type of incident happens, who the people who help you are, and, and uh, by that, I mean the vendors you've identified that help you triage these incidents. And so that leads me to my second point, which is you should identify trusted vendors that you can lean on immediately so you don't have to do what so many organizations do, which is Google, cyber incident, what do I do? Cyber forensics, help. And if you identify, for example, a breach coach, a forensics firm, and a communications firm, you can immediately reach out to them. They'll be Their contact information will be included in the incident response plan. The decision maker will be identified in the, in the incident response plan, and they will reach out to these vendors who will help you to immediately coordinate your response. Do the early work, identify the vendors, and then if you have a little bit of money to spend on it, 
bring them in and do what's called a tabletop exercise, which is a simulated incident so that you can actually embody your incident response plan. You can identify gaps in it and flaws in it, and you can see how the first hour or two or three of this incident should unfold. That much planning makes an enormous difference. And it, what it does also is it eliminates some, uh, some mistakes that we see on and on. Yeah, I love it. You definitely don't want to be Googling, how do I put my, what do I do when my house is on fire while it's on fire? If you yeah. can do that beforehand, really helps. I would add one more thing to the brilliance that you listed, and that is make sure you have a paper backup of that plan. The last thing you want to do <laughs> is be locked out of your servers and not get access to that beautiful plan. Katie, over to you. Same question. Yeah, it's very similar to, and echo everything that Eric said, it's very similar. So we you know, as a communications partner um, come in, usually through folks like Eric, or if you have your incident response plan and you already have already identified, you know, Edelman or whoever your communications partner is, we're brought in there and usually through a three-party letter of agreement, which is the contract stuff behind the scenes. But, you know, I will say that having those partners in advance not only helps you because you're prepared, but also gets you a team. Um, you know, Edelman is the largest global communications firm in the world. We do this work all the time, every day for clients, you know, and we're dealing with a number of clients, you know, before this call and after this call that have ransomware attacks. I will say it's not often, but we are turning down business right now. And I would say that's, that's rare, but it happens. We've turned down business in the last little while because there's so much of this. So I do think the importance of locking down your partners you know, is more than ever because we've never had to do that in the past. It's just, you know, prolific. So on the communication side, I would just say, I echo what Eric says, in addition to the incident response plan, which is a little more um, logistics and IT focused and legal focused, there's a companion PR piece um, and a communications DSP, you know, data security privacy communications plan that can lack, that can mirror sort of the same scenarios that you have in your incident response plan. But what are the common messages you'll use, what are the audiences, what are the channels. So I would do that and then also do tabletops to test and have your communications team and or your partner as well. In those tabletops, you will find a ton of extra, a ton of value. Um, and, and there's always learnings from that. My, my favorite nugget about what you said is when you were saying that sometimes there could be the case if you're turning down business. Can you imagine you're calling an organization because your house is on fire and they're saying, sorry, like we're just too busy. We can't take that on. So definitely you want to line yeah, this stuff up. I don't want to scare head. everyone, but, it, but it's a reality we've never had to face before this year. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Annie, I would uh, add one, one thing to Katie's point there, and it is the criticality of, of the early communications. And so you need to make sure that you have an IRP and a chain, a chain of command that limits the early communications early on so that you can strategically communicate through the incident so that those who should be speaking are the only ones who are speaking. And you can identify those people in a communications chain of command in your IRP. You know, that makes a lot of sense. I, I typically find with larger organizations, they are very good at that. They have certain people that have had media training or have had some sort of PR training, and they're the only ones that are allowed to represent the company for certain messages. I find in, in smaller organizations, it's not as called out, but that's an excellent point, uh, Eric. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, over to you. Same question. Yeah, I, I'd echo a lot of the things that both Eric and, uh, and Katie have said. Um, I, I would add that the, the, the best way to, uh, to prevent the situation is to avoid it um, altogether. So um, having, uh, th there's a certain list of kind of key technology pieces and key process pieces and key uh, people pieces uh, that I would advise that, that customers have uh, at least checked off and, and have in place and, and not just the technology piece, but those other three. Um, as it relates to the IRP and, and, and the work done to kind of prepare for a cyber attack, um, I'll, I'll echo something that, that I know you're very passionate about, Danny, and that's making sure that the people that might be involved are trained in that IRP. Just having it documented and having it in the hands of, of a CISO or a CIO um, is a good first step, but, but oftentimes it's going to be others in the organization that get first glimpse of, of something that's happening, and they also need to know what the process is so that they don't start um, a knee-jerk reaction doing efforts that, that actually hinder 
uh, either their recovery objective or, or a, uh, um, a root cause analysis objective that we might be going for in terms of helping the customer get out of the incident. So those are the key things, but, but putting in solid technologies, processes and people in place uh, in advance to, to help kind of def deflect or, or defend against um, the need for uh, instigating your IRP and your cyber plan. Yeah, I love it. What I love, Kevin, about what, what you're bringing to the table here and, and what, what we're really seeing from our panelists is we are really covering all of NIST here. Uh, Kevin, you're, you're more focused, your answer was more focused on protection and detection, whereas Eric and Katie, they were talking more so about response and recovery, and that really is what NIST is all about. So, Greg, why don't you take us home with, uh, with this question, same question, finish us off. Yeah, out, uh, out of fear of sounding like a broken record, I would echo everything that everybody's just said. Um, from an underwriting perspective, I can just give the entire um, the entire team a bit of insight as to what we're looking for. And, uh, you know, because everything that was mentioned, 2020 was a horrible year for cyber attacks. And it was an even uh, just as bad for the insurance industry as well. So we've started to look at focus and to, to Katie's point about turning away work, um, we're actually saying that, you know, there's minimum hygiene requirements that we need to see out of businesses in order to even qualify for insurance now uh, in, in order to qualify for cyber insurance specifically. So to ke reinforce Kevin's point, training of employees, we want to see, we want to see employees being trained on what to look for, how to spot phishing attacks, the other thing that is now table stakes for organizations, especially through COVID and the migration of, uh, of labor and work from home, multi-factor authentication. I know this is probably getting into the weeds technically, and I, I think Kevin was, was kind enough to uh, avoid doing that on the technology side <laughs> of things, but we're seeing that you know organizations that don't have it, we're not even going to cover them. We're, like it, it, It's not worth it for us at this point. Uh, the third one, backups. Really, really looking at your backups, the integrity of your backups, segregating uh, your actual backups off your traditional networks so that if someone does hit you, hit your business, you might not be forced into having to negotiate with them to get your information back. So the recoverability objective from backups and then things like patching cadence, which have always been important. So making sure your hardware and your software is up to date, not using end of life devices. And again, planning, plan, plan, plan. That's the big thing. Yeah, Greg, that was awesome. So much detail in your answer. One of the things that I want to touch on, uh, I, everything I love, but one of the things I just want to highlight is multi-factor authentication. Uh, I love multi-factor authentication, sometimes referred to as two-factor authentication on the off chance that there's anyone attending that's not sure what that is. The first form of that that we would have been familiar with was our bank cards. Long before credit cards were asking for our pins, it was the bank card that had the pin. So, so with a bank card, you've got two factors to identify yourself. One is the actual bank card. Another one, uh, of course, is the number, the pin. Somebody steals your bank card, they need your pin. Somebody steals your pin, they need your bank card, and it's that much more protected. In the world of cybersecurity, we do have solutions like that, and they massively, massively reduce the chance of a password uh, being bypassed or password being breached they do phenomenal things if that's something that you haven't ha that you don't have something you definitely want to look into okay so let's get to our next question now this last question was for everyone this next question is going to be specifically for eric so eric can you tell us what are industry leading businesses doing to protect their customer data sure danny thanks for the question what i'd like to do is to think about this question and sort of three parts and to think about it from the lens that's really important to everybody who's listening here and that is cost right because we're going to have some people that are listening here that are part of smaller organizations that aren't going to be able to carve out a lot of their budget to prepare for an incident like this other organizations may have a nice chunk but it's some new spending and then other organizations may be fully committed and may have an adequate budget to implement all leading safeguards so let's start with easy and inexpensive. And you've already heard reference to MFA, multi-factor authentication. This can be done with a simple app like Duo Mobile or other apps that uh, essentially put in your hand 
the second way to authenticate your sign in. It's just an app and you press a button so you can get in. That means if somebody steals one of your workers logins or credentials, they will not have the second way to get in. They will not be able to access your organization. And that is relatively inexpensive and easier to roll out depending on the size of your workforce. The second thing which Greg alluded to is active patching, just making sure that your software is up to date. The key to that is making sure that you have uh, someone on staff that is focused on that. And, and almost all organizations at least either have somebody hired or they have an external vendor that is responsible for that type of IT hygiene. The third thing that's relatively inexpensive is putting together an IRP. Now that may sound like it takes a lot of lawyering. It may sound like it takes a lot of consultants. Doing it the best way, of course I would advise, bring in a lawyer like me to help you design it and to help you iron out implementation. But if that's not in the cards for you cost-wise, you can just Google it. You can literally find an IRP on the internet, see what it looks like and start to plug it in. You'll need somebody on the inside to take initiative, to, to employ it and to uh, train everybody up on it. But you can put that in place without too much outside expense. Thinking about the moderate cost, something where you may require a vendor to come on site and to do some work uh, remotely um, over the course of time, I would say employing a training platform. Now, now folks say reduce human error or a training platform. What are we really doing to our employees to train them to avoid this kind of risk? Anyone in this business will tell you human error is the most common way that these bad guys get in. So what a training platform is going to do is it's going to explain what these fake emails look like. They're going to teach you how in the to and the from bar to spot the types of things that, that these tricks that these criminals use. And what I like to say sort of casually is the training program helps to refine your employees' spidey sense. They're sort of intuitive sense that there's something wrong about this email. One of the funny things about the nomenclature here is that it's all called phishing. And what you want to teach your employees to do is find out if something is fishy. And there are a lot of ways to do that through relatively inexpensive training platforms. And they work. I can tell you 10, 11 years ago, when I first started doing those training platforms, I learned from them. I learned how the bad guys get you. And then the more expensive um, but very worthwhile endeavors that organizations are doing relate to data mapping and data segmentation and segregation. And Greg alluded to this, but what it really means is there are companies that can come in and look at your system at your practices and procedures and tell you what type of data you are taking in from your consumers and where it is on your system. Once they start to look at that, you get a better sense. One, am I taking in a bunch of sensitive data that I don't even need, that I'm not monetizing or using to communicate with my consumers or to, to um, charge them for services? If so, stop, eliminate that form or that field within your form to collect that data in the first place and destroy it. But if you do need to collect it, these organizations will help you identify where it is and they will help you segment it. And what that means is they'll put it in a separate location that is not connected to every other user on your system. They'll create credentials where only a few people can access it. And as Greg alluded to, they may even completely segregate it from your network in the case of backups so that it is viable and it is uh, walled off from any attacker. So there's easy, there's moderate, and there's expensive, but those are all ways that organizations are protecting themselves in advance of these uh, in advance of these incidents when they look at their data. Yeah, man, there's so much I love about what you said. A couple of things I just want to touch on is the data mapping. Absolutely beautiful. All crime, not just cybercrime, all crime begins and ends with what the bad guys want. In this world, what do they want? And they want data. So yeah, we got to know where it is, where we store it, how we store it, who we allow access to it. Really, really great point. I love the point about training. As Kevin said before, I'm extremely passionate about training when it comes to cybersecurity awareness. Yes, yes, and yes. And the other thing that I really loved about what you said is when you talked about the IR plan, the incident response plan, is yes, ideally we want professionals involved. But if you're in a situation where you cannot have that happen, man, start with the conversation. 
Google it and, and start doing some initial research. Start with something really, really excellent feedback. So let's go to Katie. And for our question number three, uh, question number three is for Katie. And the question is, how does communications in PR fit into the overall response and work with other response partners and clients? Thanks. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, as I, I kicked off sort of in the intro, think of us as the protector of reputation. So legal is helping you with legal liability and risk. You know, your IT team and your forensics teams are helping you protect your systems. You know, we're helping you protect your relations, relationships and reputation. And I think, you know, something that we talked about at the beginning is really at the end of the day, we understand this is a business. You're running a business. You have business decisions to make. And all of that is important in this context as you're responding. And so our, you know, our approach is always grounded in the business objectives here and for the most part, you know, I think, look, when I started this work 25 years ago, less on the cyber side, but just on crisis and reputation risk, you know, legal and PR would sometimes be at opposite spectrums of what we thought companies should be saying or doing. I, really, we don't see that as much anymore. There may be some instances, but most of the time we're aligned. You're probably seeing that in your own organizations. If you've got uh, general counsels or communications teams, you know, a lot of those times we agree because everyone with the phone is a reporter. Everybody is a citizen journalist. You know, every employee in your company that hears about something may share it with a friend, not even, you know, with malicious intent, but suddenly your incident is leaked externally. And so we are there to help, you know, work with you and be that protector of reputation and thinking about that, you know, all along. The second um, piece that I mentioned is we really are working hand in hand with your team, your legal team, um, and your forensics team here. So we don't want to, we're planning for the communications for what's happening tomorrow, for what's happening next week, as well as what's now. And as you work through an investigation, we want to evolve the communications so that it stays in lockstep with what you know. So if you're able to rule something out or rule something in, you can evolve the communications and whether you're having that as a holding statement, we will often prepare a lot of materials that, that don't even make the light of day, but you're just ready for them so that if you're forced to communicate at some point through a leak, through the attacker going directly to your clients or your employees, you know, you have something that's ready. You're not scrambling in that moment. Um, certainly ransomware has forced people to communicate a lot more, uh, a lot sooner, but it's not always the case. Not every case, you know, when Kevin's team and others and your teams are doing a great job on the prevention, sometimes you're actually able to prevent full encryption or some things are encrypted, but your operations aren't impacted. So you may be able to keep things under wraps a little bit longer, or you may be able to communicate about an outage initially and not about a data attack or a ransomware attack. And in other instances, you may have to. So I would say we're working in lockstep with that team, creating what you need to communicate, you know, immediately as, all, as well as what's coming down um, the pike next. Uh, and then the other point I would just make is that we're, you know, as part of that reputation protector, we're thinking about the different stakeholders. So I would say a lot of companies forget about employees. They only think about clients and customers, which is natural, right? Um, that's who you're in business with, but you're also in business with, with your employees. You need them. You don't need them to have all the details. Certainly, <laughs> we'll talk about that. That's some of the mistakes people make, but you do need them to know if they get inquiries, where to direct them. You know, you do need to give them guidance so that if their neighbors are asking or someone else is asking and there's a media report that people aren't, you know, speaking off, off the cuff or making things up or telling people there aren't, there's, there's nothing if there is something. So you just, you need guidance for employees and you need to make sure they know, um, you know, they, they know a little bit about the incident or also that they know the workarounds or what they need to be doing differently to support customers and the incident. Yeah, that's awesome, Katie. What I, I think my favorite part about what you said was the importance of talking to employees. It's, I, I think it's something that I don't hear enough in this industry. And, and as you also talked about, everybody has a device and has the ability to get word out to a lot of different places. So man, if we forget about talking to the employees, uh, this could cause us quite a bit of trouble. The other thing that I loved is, is as you were talking about the different partners that you communicate with, you're really showing how much evolution has happened in the world of cybersecurity. 20 years ago, who are we talking to? 
there was the software person, there was the hardware person, and then there was the professional services person, right? And now there's so many more things to consider even outside of the world of security. Thank you very much for that, Katie. Okay, so my next question is for Kevin. One of Probably one of my favorite questions that I'm gonna be asking today, that is, Kevin, what is one of the first things the client needs to consider in the event of a breach? Well, and, and, and we get asked this, uh, uh, unfortunately, sometimes after the fact, when we get a, a phone call um, from clients that have had something happen. And, and one of the first things and we, we need to look at is, is, I guess, what's the objective and, and, and who, should we, who should we be involving? If the customer has not already involved someone like Eric and, uh, and their insurance provider, because we often get called in those cases where, uh, where they necessarily maybe don't want to go through and claim their insurance, then ultimately, what is the objective? We actually get asked a lot of questions by clients that really should be directed to the likes of, of Eric and Greg, um, and, and specifically around, well, um, do I need to call the police about this? Should I, should I have to report this uh, publicly? And these are questions that, that Eric can help answer, um, as well as, uh, as Katie, in terms of if there is an answer to, to, to actually do that. Uh, but one of the first things is really, what is the objective here? Are we, is the organization uh, not too concerned about kind of how it happened? And is the company, or are they concerned about just recovery? I got to get going again. Um, I always, and it, it's a bit of a not bad analogy, but I use the analogy of a hotel room where a crime has been committed. You can tape off the hotel room and, and, and go and do investigation, or you can take the tape off, vacuum up the floor and say, okay, now we can rent the room again. And uh, I, I think the customers need to consider if they're doing that and they start to do uh, things and get a knee-jerk reaction without an IRP or, or, or not following the IRP, what the impact to the rest of the process might be. That's regardless of whether it's a ransom or any type of attack. Yeah, that's a phenomenal answer. Uh, such detail. And, and I will add... I'm pretty sure I've stayed in a hotel room that had a crime scene in it and that they, <laughs> that they didn't properly clean up uh, after the fact. So, so thank you for that, Kevin. So my next question is for Greg. And what I love about my next question, my next question leads into probably my favorite cybersecurity solution. And funny thing is, it's not even cybersecurity. So Greg, how does insurance fit in with incident response? So it's a great question, and I, I think we've already seen one of the one of the questions about an all-in-one sort of solution coming from the chat. Uh, and insurance, insurance is the last sort of thing uh, that once you've done all of the preventative steps, once you've uh, you know involved, made sure that you've identified who's going to be on first, so you you know how you know Eric's number, you know where where you're calling, you know Kevin's number. Um, and, and you've identified who's on your panel and everything else, the insurance can really just help support one in covering those costs. But what we see a lot of the time for small businesses is a, it, it pre-identifies a lot of the, the experts for an organization. So it's almost, it, you know, insurance is meant to be that sleep easy type of, of contract that you, that you enter into. So it's, um, it, it should dovetail in a, very nicely with everything that's been discussed today. I think if there's any brokers on on the presentation today, um, the what the way that insurance should be considered is you should have a conversation up front. It should always be communicated. If an or if a client or an organization already has retainers in place or has identified their people that they want to to involve, then having that on the table so that in these events that when when there is a claim on the table that uh, everything's been pre-talked about and, and communicated and there's no surprises. So the, the toughest thing from an insurance perspective is, um, is, is getting involved, you know, ransomware happens on a Friday, you get a call the following Friday saying, hey, we paid it, uh, can we have our money? And the insurance company at that point, there's no, we have no forensics evidence. We don't know who the breach coach was. And, and these things, the insurance contract is just that. It's a contract. It's not a blank check. There's consent provisions that need to be adhered to. And having, having a quarterback like, like Eric 
uh, involved, who knows when to when to talk to the insurance company and, and when to involve them and when to make requests and when to push and when not to. Um, it, very, very, very important. But the the overall answer is insurance should just tuck in nicely to your to your plan. And if if done properly and vetted properly and having those conversations, um, you know, it's it it should be a very, very seamless integration. Yeah, that's awesome, Greg. And I, I'm going to go back to something I keep saying. I'm going to go back to that NIST framework, that five point framework. The last piece on that five point framework is recovery. And when it comes to a financial recovery, nothing's going to help you out better than cyber insurance, but you got to understand it. And of course, like Greg says, you don't call them on a Monday after you've done something, say, hey, where's my money? You involve it and you got to do it properly and follow the process properly. So my next question, you talked about the importance of working with somebody like Eric. My next question is for Eric. Eric, what is the best advice you can give an organization that has suffered a privacy breach? Unmute your mic is the first piece of advice I would give you. Um, is, yes. <laughs> the second one is slow down. It can feel, when this incident happens, it can feel like the entire world is crashing down upon you. It's crime. Most people aren't experienced at being a victim of crime. And it also can feel as though your entire business infrastructure is very fragile and is in jeopardy. And it may be. The advice I give you is slow down and trust your plan. Reach out to someone like me immediately because what I can do then is like I noted earlier, help coordinate the response. So the first thing you need to do is get the team in place and triage the response. And when you have experienced people who come to the table and help you respond to this, they can help you prioritize the components. There will be a... Um, you know, a forensic response where you have to identify what's happened, identify what data was at stake, but that's going to land second in priority to recovery, to technical recovery, reestablishing your systems, implementing your backup. Of course, the communications component will bubble up. It depends. Sometimes ransomware now is being very closely tracked on the internet. There are sites dedicated to reporting on these incidents. So you may get a media inquiry. All of a sudden, that may bubble to the top of your priority list. And so the idea here is to slow down and constantly, day after day, identify your recovery priorities. That's my short-term piece of advice. Get the people on the ground, slow down, and every day check in and identify your recovery priorities. The longer-term advice I would give is not from someone like me. What I'm going to do is lay out for you your legal obligations and options. I'm going to tell you what the law says you have to do in response, but I'm not going to tell you what is right. You need to also ask what is right. And this comes back to Danny's story about Uber, and it comes back to Katie's point about employees. Quick anecdote. You may not, after an incident, be required to notify your employees that their data has been jeopardized. It depends on what law applies. You may only be required by law to notify your consumers. But does that mean you shouldn't notify your employees? That's a question you have to ask yourself. I may be thinking, am I doing what's legal? But you also should be thinking, am I doing what's right? And it comes back down to questions of corporate culture and and um employee retention, and corporate brand. They're bigger questions you need to ask beyond just what does the law require. And so you have to use my advice to make those bigger decisions. Yeah, I love it. Doing what's legal, doing what's right, and having an understanding of the difference because they're not always the same thing. You know, on, on that note, and on a note for our next um, uh, who's going to answer our next question is I was told a long time ago before I even got into the world of cybersecurity, if you have access to a good lawyer and if you have access to a good PR specialist, you can pretty much take over the world. It's true for life. It's also true for cybersecurity. So my next question is for Katie. And so, Katie, my question to you is why are the first 24 to 72 hours so critical from a communication standpoint with regards to a breach? Yeah, so as we talked about before, obviously, you know, things are happening quickly. Um, and as Eric can say, has said, the pressure, um, I think that's what, you know, if you haven't been through these kinds of incidents, particularly if it's like a ransomware and your systems are down, 
you haven't been through that the pressure and emotion that comes with that when your phone is blowing up, sometimes your email's not working, everyone's chasing you and everybody has needs from you. It's, I mean, it's really overwhelming. And as you're trying to work through the problem, um, sometimes that communications gets lost. So part of what we're thinking about, as Eric said, is developing holding statements. Are we calling it, for example, if you have, an, if you have your systems are offline in some way, shape or form, are you calling it an outage? Or are you saying you had a ransomware attack? You know, those decisions that you're making, are you calling it an incident? Are you calling it an attack? Are you saying you're a victim? Are you, you know, all of those words that you use very early on have implications for the life of the incident in some cases. Um, and sometimes we're not brought to the table until a couple of days in and the communications that's happened in the interim, you know, sets a path forward that you can't, you, you know, you can't um, change. So you have to work with it. And it's not that it's wrong to Eric's point, there's, you know, there's lots of shades of gray here. It's not a black and white decision. There's lots of different paths for you um, as your company and in your reputation and what's happening. And the context is really important. So you can't just, you can Google things, but you can't just apply the same statement you saw another company issue because there may be reasons they've acknowledged it's ransomware. <laughs> Maybe everyone in their, in their, you know, all their employees got a note on their computer and you know it, it's it's out there right people know so calling it anything different is going to be a challenge from the beginning but all of those things can buy time so i think we are thinking about setting the narrative um and it's all you know it's all got to be based on fact and what's happening but the words you choose and how we're going to describe what's happening you know early on is going to be important and ideally in these situations you want what you're whatever you're describing to kind of hold the line for a while, right? So those initial holding statements, they may talk about an outage, looking into it, whether you're using investigating, all of those things are important. But some of the messages that are really important to communicate would be things like, if you've engaged law enforcement or if you've notified law enforcement, that can be a reassuring message in some instances. Doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do for your business if you're still evaluating paying or other things, but that might be a message we wanna use if it's something you've said. The fact that you've engaged leading forensics firms or forensics experts outside of the company that are independent, that is again, a reassuring message for a lot of customers to hear, for investors to hear, whether you know, you're a publicly traded company or even just your owners. There's a lot of things there that, that could be helpful to say and communicate early on. So thinking about some of that, that narrative is important and not sort of sharing too much early on. I can't tell you how many times I'm sure everyone on this panel has come into a situation where there's a lot of detail given to clients or for employees or others about what's happening. And it's just, again, it's hard to pull back from that level of detail and then go to a, you know, a different level of transparency. So when I think about transparency, you know, and it, you know, do you want to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? The answer is yes, no, yes. Yes, you want to tell the truth. The whole truth you know, maybe again, you don't need to offer up stuff that you don't have answers for or that are going to create more questions and frankly spin up a lot of your clients or your consumers who are going to be worried about things that they've never thought about and you don't have a solution. You don't have a call center. You don't have a identity theft protection. You don't have any of the things to reassure them. So I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, phenomenal advice. And so many of the things that you're saying, Katie, honestly, I look at can be applied to life in general, even outside of responding to a cyber incident. And in short, I will say words matter, choose them carefully. Okay, so this next question is for Kevin. Kevin, what are some of the things companies do that harm or impact the investigation and remediation efforts? Well, can you hear me, Danny? I just yep. my, perfect. I, I went back to my mic and my headset. Um, that's a, that's a great question, and we see it uh, time and time again. And uh, largely, it comes from what I was saying before: is that kind of knee jerk reaction. And, and one of the themes of today, and Eric said, kind of take pause, take take a take a step back. Is is organizations even before they call uh, their insurance broker, even before they engage their breach coach or or the PR firm, or even uh, organizations like ourselves. They start taking action, and 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 they end up doing things that effectively can hinder um, our ability to help that customer recover quickly. Can hinder uh, or, or or make it more difficult. The communication message that goes out there um, can can make it more difficult for that customer to to then kind of make a claim against their cyber policy if they've done things already, and and ultimately make uh, the breach coach like Eric's job more difficult because now he's when he does get engaged, he's getting caught up and, and, and some things have already happened that 
Um, in the case of, and, and one of the popular topics is uh, uh, as it relates to the organization's, uh, I guess, confidentiality and the, and the um, uh, trilateral agreement between the forensics firm and the breach coach and the customer, um, things that are done beforehand with groups like ourselves or independently don't fall under that, uh, don't fall under that confidentiality and, 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 and privilege. And that becomes a, a challenge. So we see customers doing things that, that are reactive and, and, and even in the messaging side, uh, starting with messaging out to the world. Uh, one of the things I was, I was going to add to what, what uh, Katie said is that in addition to your messaging, you have to know that the potential cyber criminals and attackers are also listening. They're listening to yeah. what you're saying um, because that affects multiple things. Could affect your negotiation power if you do decide to pay the ransom. Could affect a number of things. Um, so I echo kind of what Eric said. Well, we always recommend that they engage either their in-house counsel and or their breach coach if they have, depending on the size of the organization, and, and just take pause because the things they do, starting to do recoveries, starting to shut down systems, um, so shutting down certain systems. We've had customers where they shut down systems that had a ransom uh, variant on them that if they hadn't shut the system down, the encryption wouldn't have started. But by the process of shutting the system down and then restarting it, multiple systems now are encrypted where it might have only been one. And we can come in and look for things like the hash on the various systems before they start shutting down. And it's just that knee-jerk reaction and, and, and not following the plan. Yeah, I love it, Kevin. And, and you know, hearing what you said, what you worded so, so well, I'll make a slight tweak to what I said before when I said words matter. Words matter and actions matter. Choose them carefully. True in life, definitely true when responding to a cybersecurity incident. Okay, so question number nine is for Greg. So Greg, what's the cybersecurity, sorry, yes, yeah, cybersecurity insurance market outlook for this year and for years to come? Yeah, no, and I saw Eric come off mute a little bit there too. And I, I think he was probably just going to echo the same thing that I was just picking up on what Kevin said too, because it's a, a fantastic point. You know, your, your breach coach, it, Eric called it the hair on fire. I love the hair on fire analogy. It's what uh, a, a former colleague of mine from years ago used to call it as well. But slowing down, trusting the experts, and then following the plan, um, it, it, it makes a big, big difference. The knee jerk can, can really, uh, it can take a, Kevin's the hotel analogy decision right out of your hands from day one. So uh, very, very important. Just wanted to, wanted to pick up on that a little bit too. Um, what does the cyber insurance market look like for this year and years to come? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna be painting a, a, a nice, beautiful picture with puppies and candy and roses on it uh, right now. Um, and I'll focus a little bit on Canada, just, um, you know, we're a Canadian organization, we're delivering so insurance solutions for Canadian clients. So our focus is on Canadian companies, but, uh, to give everybody a little bit of context as to how, uh, how unrosy the picture was for the insurers last year, um, total market growth in cyber insurance was actually quite positive. That was one of the silver linings. So the, the entire cyber insurance market through 2019, according to OSFI, you've got to take a, these numbers with a little bit of a grain of salt because they are self-reported. But uh, the market grew from about 120 million, roughly 117 uh, in gross written premiums to about $222 million in gross written premiums. So some very good growth. I think uh, a lot of that, you, you know, you can't hide from the fact that every business has a cyber exposure these days. So uh, we saw buying patterns increase, which was positive. I think a lot of that is a testament to the hard work that's being done by retail insurance brokers. And I will caveat this next statement uh, just based on how this market is going. This is not the insurance broker's fault at all. If you're getting bad a, a, a bad message of your premium going way up, it's, it's certainly a don't shoot the messenger. Uh, type of incident right now. Um, the Canadian context, 222 million in gross written premium versus $601 million in, pay, in payments made. Uh, in, and that doesn't include any of the expense uh, ratios that, that the insurance companies would incur. So these, these numbers are, are, are very much dwarfed. Like those are direct costs. 
And what's also important to think about is only about a fifth of Canadian businesses best guess right now. The latest numbers were from StatScan in 2017 and it was a small sample size, but had a very good uptake in terms of response rate. Um, but only about a fifth are, of, of companies are buying some form of cyber insurance. And even from the 2017 numbers, if you extrapolate out, only 66% of those were purporting to buy some form of cyber liability coverage, which to me tells me that only two thirds of those had real cyber coverage. And the other third were probably just buying some sort of tack on to a package type of policy. So the, the market right now is in a bit of a, of a tizzy, uh, dare I say. The, the re, a lot of reinsurance rates um, are, are, are negotiated for January 1. We saw some increase there, but interestingly, the supply of capital through the insurance market and specifically through the cyber insurance market with all of these losses emerging, the reinsurers are starting to tighten up a little bit. And what that really means is it's almost like a knock-on effect. So they tighten up the supply of capital. The insurance companies have to get a little bit more um, you know, tepid with how they're underwriting because now they're, they're going to be told that they have to underwrite a certain way. And that will restrict um, uh, you know, what, what one can either A, be offered in coverage or B, it becomes a simple supply and demand equation. You know, the supply of capital is being restricted. The demand for these insurance policies is going up. The elasticity curve means that price is only going one way. So it, it, prices are, are starting to correct. Um, you know, we hear all the time that there's not the actuarial data to support it. At the same time, you know, it, it's, it doesn't take a data scientist to figure out that if you're paying out $2.71 for every dollar that you take in, then you're, something is wrong there. And to me, that's not just a rate problem. That is an entire, entire controls related issue. And I think it just, every bit of advice that the panelists are providing to organizations today, we're seeing a lot of that become standard fare for underwriting decision-making going forward. So um, procuring cyber insurance is going to get more difficult um, or at least a little bit more intrusive, I think. Um, we're starting to, we're seeing some uh, scanning technology and some automated and some AI being leveraged into some decision-making. But ultimately at the end of the day, you really want your underwriters to be able to, to make decisions uh, so that your broker can negotiate the best coverage for your organization on your behalf. But uh, yeah, you know, we're seeing increases. The latest broke global broker outlook reports from one of the large alphas was cyber rates for small businesses being between 10 and 30% up. Uh, we're seeing, you know, uh, the lower end of that across our portfolio this year, but uh, yeah rate is rate is going up and I think unless some of these controls and and are instituted to to drive loss ratios down um price is going to continue to tick up over time I think that makes what you described and what we're seeing in the industry I think makes a lot of sense you know the first cyber insurance contract that I'm aware of I believe was actually created in 1998, but it wasn't an industry then. That was for an organization that wanted a contract made specifically for them. It didn't really start becoming an industry where we talked about it and we considered it as a part of our plan till probably about after 2010. So it's so new. There's still so many things to figure out, right? If you look at car insurance as an example, wow, I mean, that's existed for a very long time. Cars looked very different when car insurance well, was first enacted. So They've had a lot of years to figure out car insurance and home insurance, but something like this, I, I think we can expect to see some radical changes simply because it's so new and we're all trying to figure it out. So I appreciate uh, that info, Greg. So the last question that I have for you guys from our non-audience questions uh, is, is this is what I'm going to ask to everyone. And what I'm going to do it is I'm going to call upon you the way I did for question number one. I'm going to start with Eric, then I'm going to go to Katie, uh, then Kevin, then Greg. And the question is, what's one action people should take today to protect their company? So Eric, let's start with you. One action to take to protect your company today. Well, first things first is you can 
you can assess your insurance portfolio and see if cyber exists in your portfolio. And if it doesn't, you should email your broker and get a quote. That's one thing you can do. I don't mean to sort of steal what might have been Greg's answer <laughs> to, to this question, but that's one thing that really would help. Another thing that you can do is to determine, and I, I hate to keep banging this drum, but it's to determine if you have an IRP and if not, to identify the key decision makers in your organization and get them in the same room to start thinking about that question. That's the one thing I would recommend. Start the effort today of forming that response plan. It makes a huge difference when these incidents happen. Yeah, I absolutely wholeheartedly agree. This is not something that you wanna do after the fact, start today. So, uh, so Katie, same question. Yeah, it, it sort of mirrors what we've what Eric just said, but I would say have the conversation. So I bring the people to the table because that will get you. You will get you will be you'll be forced to very quickly if you don't have approval right now to develop an incident response plan or the communications, you know, companion to that. If you start having that conversation, so you bring all of your leaders together, your communications teams together, and you have the conversation about what would we do, what would that look like, that will open up opportunities. Uh, we often come in because on the preparedness side, because board of directors are demanding to see um, companies' plans. They're demanding to know what the communications component is to that. And they're demanding to know if you've done exercises. So you can kind of preempt that process. But a big part of that is just having the right people, the decision makers in the room and having conversations that can sometimes open up the budgets that you might need, or at least to, you know, um, authority to get some of these partners engaged early on. So I would say that would be a, a step to do is just have the conversation. That's a, yeah, great, I love that's, it. A, that's a great point, Katie, regarding budgets, because it may seem, it may be hard to get people to commit to the cost of developing a plan like this with someone like myself or a consultant to come in and help you do it. But once you start the process and the questions come in about how you're prepared, how your chain of command works and who your vendors are you're going to use to respond. When you realize you don't have any answers to those questions, the powers that beat your organization may feel exposed and they may be willing to spend some money to create security there and to create preparedness. But that only becomes revealed if you start asking the questions about how you would respond. Yeah. Well, what I love about what the both of you guys said, my, my, my takeaways from that is, is, it starts with asking the questions and it starts with a conversation. Awesome stuff. Uh, so Kevin, over to you, same question. I'm Mike, like Eric, unmute the mic. Um, my answer to that is, is uh, and similar to kind of what both Katie and Eric have said, is dependent on, uh, again, whether the customer has an IRP or not. Uh, if they have an IRP, my answer is the thing they can do today is go through the process of, of, of testing that IRP and, and, and do it more than just once. Do it continuously and update the IRP as your environment changes, as you roll out new systems, as you understand. I mean, ultimately, all of this is down to kind of risk management. If an organization does not have an IRP, uh, my, my number one recommendation is, is to engage a company that can help you build out an IR preparedness and build out that IR, IRP, uh, which will look at some of the controls you have in place and, and, and any gaps you might have with, again, a, a focus on um, your risks in terms of cost, in terms of likelihood, in terms of impact to your business um, and, and, and impact to your brand and operations. And, and that's what will come out of that. And then, again, you'll have that IRP piece that you can then you can then test against. We've had customers call that say, hey, we want to do a tabletop exercise with you. We've heard about this thing and we go in and they have no IRP. So we're tabletopping mm. a, a, a scenario that immediately blows up because we say, you don't know what to do. Like, like we're starting this and you don't have something in place. So you really have to do one before the other. Uh, and, and the answer to that question for me is, is depending on which, which, whether the customer has that or not. Yeah, excellent. I, I love that. Um, uh, you know, having that planning in place and yeah, that you've got to have that IRP um, uh, in place. Absolutely. So Greg, uh, over to you. Same question. 
Yeah, I think I would be doing my entire team of underwriters a disservice if I didn't say, uh, please turn on multi-factor authentication. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, it's number one that we're, it's the underwriting hill that we are currently dying on uh, day in and day out. But uh, no, minimum hygiene uh, from, our, from our side. That's really what we're focusing on and what we're looking for. And for small businesses, it's it, we're we're trying to keep it achievable, right? Like it's it's not it shouldn't security doesn't have to be expensive, but sec security awareness needs to be prevalent. And the you know multi-factor authentication is the first is a first step. Obviously, the step before that is having your firewalls and everything else turned on and and configured properly and not leaving any ports open. Uh, but that's really technical and. Uh, uh, you know, not, not necessarily the one takeaway. I think practice good hygiene, good cyber hygiene, you know, and um, keep in mind that IT uh, staff are not necessarily um, security experts either. They are being asked and tasked with doing two different things, especially in smaller to mid-size organizations. So, you, you know, the IT group is, it, it, they probably need some help. They definitely need some budget. And so if you're a decision maker in that, don't be afraid to ask what they need in order to do their jobs effectively. I think that's, that would be uh, one of my, my, my takeaways. I think the quote that I love the most that I'm going to take from you, I think I'm going to put it on a t-shirt. I might misquote it. We can, we can work on it together later is security doesn't have to be expensive, but security awareness needs to be prevalent. Beautiful. I will also add just my own thoughts, uh, picking up from uh, some of the things that Greg said and my own thoughts on answering that question is I'm a huge, huge believer in security awareness training to your employees. And whatever program you decide to roll out, I want you to keep three things in mind. And that is get them to believe, get them to understand and empower them. So get them to believe that this is in fact a real problem. Yes, we're on this call, we know that it is, but there are so many people in this day and age that are completely unaware of how real the problems of cybercrime is. And if your employee doesn't believe this is real, you get them to take some sort of training, it's gonna fall on deaf ears, they're gonna click their way through it and it won't matter. Get them to understand what it means to them. So many times I'll have people when they introduce me as you know for an instructor-led course, they introduce me to their employees. They'll say, you guys better listen to Danny because if we get breached, I'm not gonna get my bonus. Nobody cares whether or not leaders get, get their bonus. Their employees certainly don't care. Make it about them and let them know how damaging this could be to them personally. And the last thing, empower them. And when I say empower them, I don't mean empower them through fear. That never works. Don't empower them by victim shaming or by saying someone's stupid or someone's going to be fired if they do the wrong thing. All that's going to do is cause them not to tell you about these things and really take away your ability to respond with a lot of the great answers that, that we were talking about throughout today's session, but rather empower them to know that they can make a difference. Yes, this stuff is really serious, but getting that security awareness mindset is not that difficult. And once we understand it, once we have that mindset, we are that much more secure. So definitely, I'm a big pusher of training. And whatever it is, whatever training, whatever form of training you take, just remember, get them to believe, get them to understand, and empower them by letting them know they can make a difference. Okay, so we finished our questions, uh, our pre-planned questions. And what we're going to do now is we are going to open this up to the audience. And so if anyone has a question, you could submit your questions, and I do see there are questions submitted, so we're going to get started uh, in just a moment. Submit the questions through the Q&A section that you're going to see at the bottom of the screen, right? Fill them in there, and I'm going to call them out, and, and we're going to answer them um, together. This was scheduled to go to 1230, so I think I'm going to go on till about 1227, and then at that point, we'll start a wrap-up, and we'll let everybody um, get back to their day. So, First question, I absolutely love this question. Um, the question is, are companies meant to engage all of these different companies in the event of an incident response, or is there a one-stop shop that encapsulates technical IR, legal crisis communications, insurance? Man, wow, that is a great, that's the question of the day. Um, I'm going to throw that out to anyone that wants to answer it. I won't call on a particular name for that one because I, I, I think a few of you guys might have some, some pointed thoughts on that. Who would like to take a shot at that? 
I think I that's can, best for Greg or Eric. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. I can jump in and, and give some perspective there. And then there's an, an answer to that that Greg, I'm sure, can give in a, in a very good way. So to, I'll pivot to him after I give my first answer. The answer is, yeah, there are – you can go through a large consulting firm and generally get a rounded team just from the con- – from the consulting firm to do that, but it's going to be very expensive. And you're not going to have a particular relationship with counsel and with a forensics firm that has familiarity, pre-existing familiarity with your IT infrastructure. And so you can do that, but typically organizations like to lean on relationships that they already have and, uh, to build those out further. For example, you may already have business or corporate counsel in place that you really trust that understands your business footprint, for example, understands your client relationships and your your, uh, supply chain. That type of pre-existing understanding from a legal standpoint is really valuable to me when I'm the breach coach for a client that my firm is otherwise corporate counsel for. And so you'll want to consider whether it really makes sense to go to a one-stop shop there, or if maybe it makes sense to lean on your existing relationships. Now, if you haven't done that work in advance, you also, and I'll pivot to Greg here, you can often rely on your insurer to recommend providers in every one of these capacities, legal, forensics, communications, uh, e-discovery, all of that stuff. And so I wonder uh, to pivot here and not to steal your thunder as the moderator, Danny, but Greg, can you tell us how insurers play that role? Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, it, it, this all comes down to conversations up front and uh, have the conversation with your broker. And because not all insurance policies are created equally, um, but the insurer can't cover what it can't see in advance and putting, you know, in the event of one of these, uh, you know, very stressful situations, the last thing that you want to be doing is questioning, oh, well, what do we have to do here? And, And we've already heard the planning, that planning forms an integral part of this. So making sure that you're, you've communicated with your, through your broker to really frame out like how you expect, um, if you have a plan, how you expect it to be followed and how the insurance can dovetail in. I mean, ultimately the insurance, um, the way that we see it being purchased by small, small businesses um, is almost like the, the retainer in a box. It's the, it's the cyber SWAT team in a box. So we've, on the insurance side, we definitely have uh, preferred vendors. We get rates that are, that are um, we do this all day, every day, right? So we, we have economies of scale with our vendor partners, with our trusted experts. Um, ultimately, I, I, I agree with Eric, it, it comes down to a collaborative type of, it, type of endeavor when these things happen. Like, however you can get your breach coach and crisis comms and forensics up to speed faster to get that network topography down to get your you know your value uh, your your inherent values from your through your organization communicated and really really in, encompass everything within the the incident response piece it, it becomes very uh, one it becomes more cost effective because the experts that you're relying on don't spend as much time getting you up a, up and running again so it, it is something that um, that we certainly advocate for. We have a panel of vendors. Um, all all insurers do. If they don't, uh, they should. Um, if, if they don't, I would question whether you're buying a legitimate cyber insurance product if they can't tell you who they prefer to use a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, the the insurance policy has that cyber SWAT team ready to go to rock and roll, so that uh, you know you can call the 1888 number that you have on file or or in a note somewhere and and throw up your your proverbial I Eric mentioned the spidey senses I I'm, I'm a Batman fan too you throw up your Batman your bat the bat signal and uh, and everybody you know executes on the plan together so um, that that would be my my recommendation one other quick point Greg and that is that and this may be a bit of a self-serving answer but as long as you have breach counsel your lawyer there, one, will protect the response, keep it all privileged. But one of the main things that a breach counsel has is their Rolodex. They have a network of trusted confidants, both in communications and forensics. I mean, you heard Katie allude to earlier that 
often communications is brought in by counsel. And that's because I know all of these people. And so when you have an incident, you call me and we start to coordinate a response. I can get forensics within an hour to respond yeah. to you because that's the way this business works. So as long as you have a trusted counsel to help you quarterback the response, all of those vendors are going to line up immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there are ways of, of listing specific vendors and there's, there's different types of coverage out there. You know, uh, I think this one type of this one coverage uh, benefit is probably going to be uh, pulled back a fair bit because of the loss history in, in Canada thus far, but we used to see retention or deductible waiver endorsements where it was trying to incentivize good client behavior and, and what, that would, what that means is there were specific vendors listed on these endorsements. So if you call Eric as the breach coach and Kevin as the forensics, whatever deductible you would have on your policy will agree to waive. Because at that point, we know that our experts are going in. We trust them. We have the pre-negotiated rates. Everything runs smoothly. Um, and, and it just it makes it a world of difference. Um, so I, I, would, I would highly recommend having a conversation with your broker about how you expect to see a, a situation go. And then it, I think it's, it's uh, you'll see uh, a number of really, really, really great uh, cyber insurance brokers in, in Canada that, uh, that are able to have these conversations, make these plans and line everything up for your organization and be true risk management partners with you. And when you nail that really well, that relationship with your broker and your breach coach lawyer, then it's like that project manager that I, situation that I described before. It's like you have one person who's going to pull in all the other pieces and really going to make your life easier during a time when it's really things are unpleasant. So, so that being said, and talking about insurance, talking about breach coach lawyers, I do have an insurance related question. So Greg, we are going to pass this on to you. The insurance related question is, if an attack is considered an act of war, are customers still covered? So the, my, my response will this, to this will be short, but two pronged. Um, one, there is yet to be a cyber event that has been considered an act of war. This is being actively debated. Uh, I know in, US, in the US Congress, but also uh, globally. So we don't have a specific event that has tested that yet. Um, however, one thing that you should be looking for um, is common to all insurance policies is a war exclusion, war or similar events. So take a look at uh, the actual language within that war and terrorism exclusion. What we, the way that we handle it is we actually define cyber terrorism so that it can be picked up and you can carve back, um, which is a weird way of, of uh, insurance speak for saying that you're including something by saying that we're excluding all of this except for this part. And so the, the war and terrorism exclusions or the standalone terrorism exclusions, just take a look and make sure that there's cyber terrorism related carve backs. What that does is if it is deemed to be nation state based, it, uh, it could save your, your, your keister in the event of uh, you wanting to bring a claim. Yeah. I think what, what I mostly take away from what you said is have a good understanding of your own policy. Regardless of what Greg said, regardless of what anyone would say on this, don't take that to say, okay, well, I guess I don't need to read my policy uh, because I heard it here, right? Make sure you, under you have an understanding of what your policy covers. Make sure you understand what it doesn't cover. And of course, make sure you're comfortable with what that is. Uh, so next question. Uh, you know what? I think I'd love Kevin to take a stab at this next question. Uh, and the next question is, how are organizations dealing with incidents associated in the cloud? Kevin, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And, and, and cloud is obviously very pervasive these days with organizations moving to it um, in, in various different aspects of their business. The, the approach is pretty much the same as on-prem. Uh, the tools might be different that we leverage. And in this case of a, of a cloud, you're often having to involve that cloud provider um, in, in any log sources that they may have or elsewise. And, and obviously, if you have log collection already and you're, and you're doing some tools today, making sure that those tools incorporate um, th those logs from those cloud events and cloud systems as well. But, but really, the, the, the approach is the same as, as on-prem, but just the tools might be different. 
Yeah, I love it. It's perfectly worded. That's exactly it. You know, a lot of times when we start doing business in different places, when we put data in different places, whether it's the cloud, whether it's our refrigerator, whether it's our whatever it is, it's really a lot of the same principles that we're applying. Just as you said, we might be using different tools. So my next questions are, are I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine two of them into one. They are for Greg. They are with regards to cyber insurance. Okay, so this is going to be a two-parter, Greg. One part is, what do you recommend for small to medium-sized businesses in terms of cybersecurity insurance? And while you're thinking of how you're going to respond to that, what do you recommend in terms of training? So, so someone is asking, saying, hey, listen, training is being recommended a lot. We know it's very important. But the fear is, what if they implement some training and the insurance says, no, that's not good enough? How do they get around that? Okay, so why don't we start with that small to medium business and then segue over to the training from an insurance point of view? Sure. Right. What do you got? So small to medium sized businesses are definitely, um, you know, it, it, it is different. It, it is very much different. We segment small mid sized business as zero to 100 million. And as a result, we try and make it a little less. Um, uh, less of a barrier to acquire insurance as, as a result. So it's it, a lot of insurance is still traditionally done by uh, self self application. So we're asking questions about different things for us, small businesses uh, recommending we have we have four pieces of hygiene that we we would want to see a small business do in order to qualify for for insurance. I think I mentioned them earlier, but patching, you know, just having a patch management policy for any critical patches that are coming out. Uh, two is turning on your multi-factor authentication, which again I know I sound like a broken record, so I apologize for that. Uh, three is training is actually the training, and um, I'll, I'll I'll touch on that a little bit more as part two. And then four is uh, the backups and just provisioning and segregating your backups and making sure that those there is an element of recoverability in the event that you were you were to get hit. So to touch on Kevin's uh, question or, or the the question that that Kevin just answered about cloud, we oftentimes see you know we're on OneDrive or we've we've got everything in SharePoint. So Microsoft has us backed up. What's interesting to note about that is. Um, that is only for a temporary amount of time and the average dwell time of this malware goes beyond the 90 days that Microsoft keeps things. So having another, if you're, if you're fully on board with cloud, one, protect a separate cloud uh, backup solution, but it can connect in and you can actually have it provisioned with multi-factor authentication. The, the cost of that is so, so minute. Uh, to give you an example, we pay less than, my entire company pays less than $500 a year to get that sort of security on, on, on top of our Microsoft environment. So it, it can be very cost effective and very, very effective in, if you get hit by ransomware. From a training perspective, we've also segregated it for small and mid size and small and large size businesses. So from zero to 100 million, we want to see evidence that you are actually training your employees on some form of awareness. So that awareness training should include phishing and spoofing and uh, you know whaling, so that at least you know a, a bit about okay, what are my employees going to see? And, and tracking that training. So being able to, to actually make sure that you're administering the, your training across the entire organization. And it's not just going to specific people and people are held accountable. So, you know, if you've got, um, I was always in sales, uh, sales, sales departments are notoriously difficult to pin down on doing this stuff. So making sure that your sales department goes through and takes that training. So above 100 million, what we're seeing now be truly, really effective uh, in getting this message, and we're actually requiring it for organizations that do over 100 million in revenue, is active phishing campaign training. So actually testing your employees. One, it's one thing to get the training. It's another thing to test them and make sure that they're, that they're listening to it and taking it to heart. And then I know that I would be remiss if I didn't say uh, our moderator uh, today has a wonderful, wonderful in-person training that uh, we highly recommend. Uh, Danny's obviously a wonderful presenter and can't, can't uh, tell you how well received he's been uh, amongst our client base when, when doing the, the in-person training as well. So uh, hope that answers the question. 
Awesome, Greg. Very, very thorough. And, and thank you for the shout out. So just doing a time check here. We are coming to the end of time. I know companies um, are, uh, sorry, I know people are still asking questions. So it's always been my experience in these sorts of things that anybody that's asked a question, if we don't get to answer it here, we will make sure that ISA representatives are going to take these questions. And we're going to make sure that we get back to you with an answer. But at the same time, we also want to honor everyone's time commitments. So Lindsay, I'm going I'm to call upon you. If, if you're there, if you could let me know if you're still there. I just have a quick question. There you are. Perfect. So Lindsay, my question to you is, is being that we're heading out, it's 1229 right now. Do you see that as a good idea? Should we should we begin to wrap here and then take these questions that people have asked that we haven't answered and get back to them with the answer? Or do you want to keep going with these with these uh, answers? What are your thoughts? Thank you so much, Danny. So we will respond to them after the panel. Any any un unanswered questions, we'll send in a follow up. Very good. So so what I will say is, is I'll add in my thoughts and Lindsay, I'm going to pass it over to you for the close. My thoughts is, you know, guys, thank you for, for so many of you stayed with us on this call. Thank you to ISA for putting this whole thing together. Thank you to Lindsay and Michelle for keeping us all organized in the background. Um, and thank you, of course, to all of our wonderful panelists. I will say this is I know that this has been recorded. To any of you guys that have come in a bit late or maybe have to jump off, make sure you give this watch again. The thorough information that we were given from a legal expert, from an insurance, from a PR and cybersecurity absolutely phenomenal. Uh, uh, this stuff is so key and, and just the level of info, uh, blown away by, by what you guys brought to the table. Really, really love being here. Lindsay, over to you. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, everyone, just before you leave, we would love to hear your feedback on this event. Uh, there will be a two minute survey that will pop up in your browser when we click off. So please fill that out. And um, if you complete it by May 13th as a token of our appreciation, we'll send you a $10 gift card to Starbucks. So once awesome. again, thank you so much everyone for joining us today. I hope you found this very valuable and have a great day. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.